Also, next uh, next week the the loonies will be here, and we're going to honor our graduates. Uh, so we've got something for Shauna uh, if she could be here next week. Okay, we're going to honor the graduates. I know it didn't finish out like it was expected to, right? But it it, it, it did finish. Okay, so we're uh, thankful for our graduates. Um, I I just think that, and I'm an assessor. I always assess stuff, right, to an excessive amount. That's just me. And uh, with our condition of our, our, our country, as I was standing there, that there's so much trying to push God out of our country, out of the public eye, off of our monuments, uh, our, the foundations. The Bible says if the foundations are broken, what will the righteous do? And that's really, the, I think, the movement is to remove our foundations because then you can rewrite where you go, right? Because your foundations is what anchors you, correct? It's what holds you in place. It's what keeps you stable. And if we can remove those foundations, then we can rewrite history any way we want to. Does that make sense? Or am I, am I, is that just me or you all see what I'm talking about? So um, as in the days and weeks and months moving forward, Focus has got to be key. That um, the Bible tells us, I heard this just the other day. Someone said the statement, what is the world coming to? How many ever heard that? Well, just what is this world coming to? And I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, I know what it's coming to. I mean, we read the book. We, we know how some of this is going to unfold. But the Bible tells us not to be fearful of that time as to understand that these things must happen it doesn't mean we're ignoring pain and 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 all the issues that people are going through because it's real it's reality but at the same time the bible says when you see these things happen look up and keep your attention and your focus in the right place right the bible calls the end times the great and terrible day of the lord and someone asked me one time was it great or is it terrible well the answer is both it is a great day for some, but it's also a terrible day for others. So we also understand that, that, that Christ is coming back. And there's certain things that are going to have to happen for that to unfold. But God's always provided a way out for His righteous. As far back as the Old Testament, there's always been a provision. Amen? For God's people. So hang tight. Hang in there. Strengthen your faith. Don't run on empty. Fill your tank up every single day. How many likes to drive their car around on empty? Some of y'all do, I can tell. Okay? <laughs> Why? What is wrong with you people? Okay? We'll pray for you, right? Okay? I mean, it's just as easy to fill the top half as it is the bottom half, right? Okay. <laughs> so I told that to somebody one day, and they said, well, you know, gas stations are open 24-7 now. Mm, okay. I get it, but there's still, there's nothing wrong with having a full tank of gas. We wouldn't do that with our cars. Why do we do that with ourselves? You've got to put stuff in the tank. You've got to fill up. Fill up, fill up, fill up, okay? And that's not the message. Uh, we're going to get on to that. Are you ready for the message? We're going to wrap up the, uh, are we there? We're there, okay. Um, we're going to wrap up this series on giants. How many is ready for this series to go away? Okay, it's been forever, right? I mean, we've been seven weeks on this topic, and so I get it. Uh, we do series around here in like three or four, maybe five, but not seven, right? We don't do seven. Well, for this, I feel like we needed to. And today we're going to wrap this up uh, on this series on giants. And so um, this is not, still not working, okay? You got me? She's a good girl. She's got me back there. And so we're going to, here we go. We're going to get into this idea of giants. We're going to put a wrapper on this, take it a little bit step further on some things I had not seen before with David and Goliath. And so the last several weeks, we've talked about the giants of apathy, fear, pride, and the lack of love. And most of our problems, from the way I process this, filter down from these four different types of issues. If you go back and look at issues in relationships, why churches don't make it, why families don't make it, marriages don't make it, it all comes back into these issues here. 
There may be some more that could add to later, but for right now, these are the big ones. I feel like if I can take this giant in here, if you understand what I'm talking about, take him to task, right? And realize where's my apathy at? How many knows most people have good intentions? Okay? And we judge others by <laughs> what they do, but we judge ourselves by our intention, right? We intend to do this. We intend to do that. And, and, and so, but everybody else, we judge them by what they do or don't do, right? So I got, where's the apathy in me? What is it that is, can I just be honest? What is it in me that's lazy, that just doesn't want to do it, Right? But it's hard to, to walk in victory. If I can't get vict victory over dishes or the laundry, then how am I going to be victorious over anything else, right? So I, 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 this apathy thing is huge for us and because what happens is we get passive. And we just think, well, I can't change that, so I just don't do anything, right? And to the perfectionist people out there, if we can't do it right, then we just don't do it at all. Anybody a perfectionist in here know what I'm talking about? If we're, if we're not going to do it with excellence, we just don't want to do it. How many knows that can be good in some respects, but not so much in others, right? We're shooting for excellence, not perfection. Okay, we've got to move on from that one, right? All right. Fear, pride, lack of love. These are the things that we get into, into issues that, that filter off into all other kinds of things. We, we've said this, that these are the key victories that open doors. Anytime I choose humility over pride, that's a win, Amen. right? It's a win. Anytime I choose obedience over disobedience, that's a win, right? Anytime I choose dependency on God over independence, that's a win, right? We want God to help out in the areas that we don't do very well in, and then we want to be independent, but then we want God to help out when we don't make it. You might know what I'm talking about. So the idea is, let's just get really dependent upon God. How many knows he likes that? He created us to be dependent. I mean, even you look at the church, the church is really designed not to be about one person. And you've heard me say that for the last, going on three years we've been here. It's, churches cannot be about one person. It wasn't designed that way. Amen? Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16, talks about each joint supplying the next. Right? I'm here to supply, and then you all supply me. And what we do, it's, it's, it's a flow of, of, of strength and power and unity when we all work together. That's the way it's supposed to be. Amen? You cannot build a church on one person. It wasn't designed to do that. The only person we are to build the church upon, that's Jesus Christ himself. Everything else is, I'm telling you, is subject to fail, right? Because it's built on humanity. So the idea is we have to walk in these victories, which means we walk together in unity. And, and that's the thing that we have to keep in mind in the church as we move forward. It, it's, it's, it's a unit. We're going together as a unit. Now, if I don't take these things on, let me ask you three questions. Here's three questions I've used in marital counseling. And let me just give them to you. Let's go on to the next slide. Three questions I've used in counseling. What will the future look like if nothing changes? In your situation you're dealing with, whatever it may be, whether it's relationships, finances, whether it's health issues, whatever it may be, what will, it look, what will happen in the future if nothing changes? It gets worse. It gets worse, yes. Yes, sir. The future would never change. It's, it's going to repeat, isn't it? Awesome. Love it. Step up. Yeah. Adults are sitting on their hands back there. And you gotta, yes, I love it. Okay? So I want things to change, so that means I have to do something different. We know that. We say that. We quote that. But how many knows when it comes time to get up at 4.30 in the morning and go to the gym, there's another voice talking to you. Right? <laughs> It's the voice of common sense saying, what was you thinking when you made that declaration you were going to go to the gym at 4.30 in the morning? Okay? Lord, I want to say that. Man, I want to say that so bad. Okay? But here's the idea. Or we're going to get up like two hours early and study and read our Bible. You know, man, we're going to get like this. We're going to do this, this, and this. 
We say it, but then we have to end up doing it because what happens if I don't implement something different into the equation, it's just going to be on the same repeat cycle. Right? Okay? I mean, back in the day, we had cassette players. Okay? Remember those, right? I go back to eight tracks. Okay? <laughs> you know what? And if there was, <laughs> with cassettes, you had to flip the thing over to get the other half of the songs, right? That means you had to do something. And then they came out with the ones that would reverse and go the other direction. Wasn't that amazing? Okay? And you can put that thing on repeat and just play back and forth, back and forth. In other words, I can't just put this thing on repeat and expect it just to work and change. If I'm, if I'm absence of peace and joy in my life, if I'm absence of, of feeling connected to God or connected to people, I have to do something with that. Or we can wait for someone else to change, right? That's a long eternity in some people's books. Let's go on to question number two. All right, the second question. What will the highest cost be if we do nothing? What's the cost? Yes, sir. You could die. You could die. Yes, there you go. Okay. In other words, if I go to the doctor and I've got some numbers that aren't good, guess what I need to do? If I can have a piece of pie every day and my numbers aren't crazy, then guess what? I probably could eat the piece of pie, right? But if I have numbers that are all over the place, then guess what I need to do? I'm preaching to the choir here. You're all doing that, right? Okay, you're all good. Okay, I'm just saying, if, if, if marriages are, are crumbling, what's the cost if I do nothing? It just doesn't fix itself on its own, right? Amen? I mean, those just... <laughs> You can't just go through and hope that somehow it gets zapped and all of a sudden it changes. So if I don't do something, what's the cost? What's it going to cost me? What's it going, is it going to cost the relationships around me? Number three, let's go on to the third question. What's my responsibility? There's a dirty word, right? Okay. What's my responsibility to bring about the change? What is it within my power, my authority to bring about change? We want God to do a lot of it, right? But then I don't put the word in. I don't fill up the tank, so to speak. But then I want God to do it all. Okay? I don't know what planet that is from, but that's the mentality we sometimes have. The kingdom was designed that we plant seed over and over and over again in our heart. We sow this word into our heart. We transform our mind by the washing of the water to the word. That's my responsibility. Amen? Okay? We can sit back and wait for God to write it on the wall when actually He's already written it down once. It doesn't have to go on the wall, right? So I cannot be ignorant of His Word and expect to walk in the blessing that God has for me. It just doesn't work that way. Amen? Church was not designed to be a drive through Oh, we got to move on. Okay. <laughs> I'm just saying, we want this thing now. We want our relationships fixed now. We want finances now, right? And it just doesn't work that way. There's process. Just like even today, thinking about raising our kids with the understanding of what a budget is. Isn't that an awesome thing? How many members budget? How many of they taught that in high school in home economics? Okay, I, I, I did my budget one time and my teacher kicked it back. So I had Jane, who I was dating, do one. And she kicked that one back, didn't she? We redid it again. She goes, no, that's a good budget. That was a really good budget there. Argued with my teacher. So I go back to my teacher and said, there, that's a good one. My girlfriend did it for me. <laughs> okay, so the idea is about responsibility. What's my responsibility, right? I can't be, you know, frivolous with my money and then expect to be good stewards of it at the same time. It doesn't work that way, does it? Okay? Let's move on to the next thing here. Okay, so what happens in 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 48? All this talking between David and Goliath had gone on. All this, this talk with his brother leading up to this. His talk with this king had led up to this. And David steps out and Goliath trash talks him. David responds back. And then there comes a time when talking is over. Amen? There's time we don't talk about it anymore. And so I, I was on the job working in corrections one day. 
and there was two guys squared off in the gym and, and they were like, you know, talking to each other and, you know, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. And finally, uh, I walked up and they said, the guy looks at me and says, are you going to stop this? I said, no, if you guys were serious, you've already done it. Okay, you've, you've talked about it long enough. Are you going to swing or not? Some thought I was provoking it. Okay, but, you know, really there comes a time when, I mean, we've talked about this long enough. What's the action now? What do I do with this? When you've prayed for the answer to come, when you've prayed for health or healing to come or finances or whatever it may be, now you just have to walk it out. Amen? You have to get up in the morning, put your clothes on, and go do what you know to do. You've got to walk it out. I wish it was easier, right? I wish I could just stay in bed and get an end result that I want. I have to get up and go do it. I mean, those faith is action. Faith is action. You've got to put some action to it, right? Either I'm going to trust God here or I'm not going to trust God. How many parents ever told you that you woke up in the morning and you were sick and you said, I can't go to school because I'm sick? And they said, well, won't you go ahead and go anyway? If you're not better, I'll come and get you. And that was a lie. <laughs> I mean, can't just be honest, right? <laughs> Parents reserve the right to lie to their kids sometimes, right? And, and, and so guess what happened, though? You put your clothes on and you went to school, and nine times out of ten, what happens? Miraculously, healing comes, and all of a sudden, you're fine. You're on the playground, right? Sometimes you just got to go ahead and do it. You got to go ahead and take the fight on. You can't sit back and talk about it. If we, let me say it this way. If we prayed as much as we talked about praying, how much prayer would we have? See, prayers become the catchphrase, right? Well, let's pray about it. Just, just pray about it. Just pray about it. Well, pray for me because of this. Pray for me because of that. And pe- How many of you ever told someone you're going to pray and you didn't pray? Don't raise your hands. I guess you all have done that. Okay, great. You all pray when you say you're going to. But there's oftentimes we say that. We'll say something like, oh, I'll pray for me and pray for this. And, and then we forget and we don't pray for them. And then they come back and say, hey, thank you for praying for me the other day. I can really feel it. Uh, yeah, no one's ever done that. Oh my gosh, okay. So this is what happened. It says that now then it happened when the Philistine arose and came to David and drew near to meet David. Next slide, please. That David ran quickly towards the battle line to meet the Philistine. It says, and then it happened. David said twice in the verses before that, this day this was going to happen. And then when the fight actually got to the place where it had to take place here, it says David rose up and ran quickly to the battle line. In other words, he didn't wait for the fight to come to him. He went to it. So in other words, if you know you're going to have to fight that fight, just go ahead and fight it. Amen? How many of us run from a fight? Run from confrontation. A lot of people don't like them, right? Okay? But the idea, if you know that fight's coming, and you know it's out there, you've got to rise up and go after it. It's not going to go away. Goliath was not going to go away on his own. David couldn't step out there and go, boo, and him run. There was going to have to be a confrontation, wasn't there? It was going to have to happen. You see? Let's go on to the next slide, please. Remember this. Saul represents apathy, and his passivity led to this standoff in the first place. The Sauls of this world will not stop the Goliaths of this world. But there will be people sit on the sidelines and criticize you while you're in your fight. That's what I'm talking about, right? Okay. In other words, you're fighting your fight of faith. You're standing and you're... St- How many times... I, I, uh, maybe... Okay. I've talked to enough late women who were wanting to divorce their husbands. And they stayed in it. But all their friends keep telling them, I'd get out. I wouldn't put up with him one minute. Kick him down the road. Get him out of there. But she's wanting to save her marriage. So who's she going to listen to? The one on the sideline who's not involved in the fight? If she says she wants her marriage to work as a pastor, I'm here to help her do that if I can. I'm here to talk her through it. 
I've had, I had I sat across from a, a man uh, just a couple months ago, and he says, I want my marriage saved. I want it to work. I can work with that. Now, she was still iffy, okay? But he wanted it to work. He said, okay, then here's how we do that. I got no business sitting on the sideline telling someone else how to fight their fight. Does that make sense? You're the one in the heat of the battle. You're the one that's putting up with all kinds of stuff. You're the one choosing to stay in that fight. Amen? You might know what I'm talking about. Okay? So, there's going to be people who are going to criticize you on how you fight your fight. They're going to tell you on how you should do your, th- your stuff, right? You know what I'm talking about? Well, I wouldn't do it that way. Right? Well, my goodness. I mean, how many knows there's more than one way to do something? Okay? I have seen people that I've had conversations with that didn't agree with me because simply I didn't say it the way they would say it. Anybody know what I'm talking about with that one? Because I didn't word it the way they would word it. They're now uh, debating with me because I'm not saying it the way they would say it. Man, people are messed up, aren't they? (laughs) We're okay, right? But the world's messed up. But we're okay, right? In here, I'm fine. It's you all that have a problem. Let's move on before I get in trouble. Okay, let's go on. In 1 Samuel chapter 18, in verse 6, it says, And it happened when they were coming that David returned from killing the Philistine, that the women came out of the city of Israel, singing and dancing and meeting King Saul with tambourines and with joy and instruments. Now, here's what's happened. David has killed Goliath. He put the stone in his forehead. He goes up and cuts his head off with his sword. David receives the head as a trophy. I mean, that's a really nice trophy to have, right? He carries the head around as proof he's killed this giant, right? Okay? Why is that important? Because the head in the Bible, in Hebrew, in the, in the Hebrew doesn't mean just a physical head. It also represents government and authority. So what did David do? David just didn't kill a giant. He took away authority and government from him. See, that's huge. When you silence the enemy, you stop that governmental voice from speaking to you as it's got authority. The enemy has no authority in here. Right? You have to stop that. Those thoughts that come and tell you that you're this and tell you that you're that, it's not going to change. Those thoughts have no hope. I've got to be the one who stops that. And I've been given the authority to do that with the Word of God. There's some thoughts you can't afford to let run around your head for very long. Amen? You understand what I'm saying? There's some thoughts I just can't afford to let them stay in there and stew and cook. Right? Because we're making mountains out of molehills where our imagination takes off and runs crazy with us. I got to cast that down quick. No, no, no. I know where those thoughts lead, right? That thought leads to this one, then this one, and this one. And I have been given authority to take charge of those thoughts. No. You're not going to prosper here. I'm going to shut you up with the Word of God. It's powerful. Okay? So here we get to this place where David now is coming into, after killing the the giant, and these women come out and they're starting to sing songs about David. How many, how many enjoys when people are praising you? Telling you how great you are, right? Patting you on the back, say, oh, brother, you're just awesome. You're this, you're going, yeah, okay. All right? Feels good, kind of, okay? Let's go on to the next slide, okay? And the woman sang and played and said, Saul has killed, has slain his thousands, and David is ten thousands. Now, but wait a minute. David's only been in one fight. He's only killed one giant. Why is he getting the ten thousands? Is that a good question, right? Yes, sir. Because he killed a giant thing that was going to always fight other people. He did do that, but also what happens after he kills the giant? What does the rest of the army go do? They go beat the other Philistines, don't they? So what happens is David gets credit for their victories. This is huge, okay? I kill one giant and they write a song about me that I've killed 10,000. See? Was that, why is that important? This fight wasn't just about David killing one giant. It wasn't about that. It was about him 
winning his battle, but then enabling others to go do it. Remember now the condition of the army of Israel. Where were they before David showed up? They're hiding behind the rocks. They are in a failed heart condition because of Goliath. Remember that back from several weeks ago? David said, let no man's heart fail them on account of him. Right? This was the condition of the armies of Israel. David kills the, Goliath, the giant, and now guess what the boys behind the rocks are ready to go do? They're ready to get back in the fight. They're ready to get back in the game. So your victory is not just about your victory. It's about helping to enable others to go out and win their fights. Amen. See, every time you give testimony, how you overcame depression, or you, 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 you got your joy back, you got your peace back, that becomes a testimony that can help those who are hiding behind rocks get back in the fight again. And David gets credited for this right here. 17-year-old boy killed one giant and they're writing songs about him. See, this is powerful. So your victories are not just about you. Your victories are about encouragement for others to go win their fights. So when you overcome, whatever it may be, and you get to share that with someone, and they take courage from what you've said, and get back in and fight one more day, man, what have you done for that person? You've helped put courage and confidence back into them where it was gone once before. This is powerful. It's powerful. I think it wasn't just about a lion that David killed. I don't think it was just about a bear that David killed. I don't think it was just about a giant that David killed. I think this battle and this lineage of David was so powerful that in the book of Luke, a blind man calls out to Jesus and says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. So David's name is still mentioned in the New Testament because of his victories in the Old Testament. See? See, your kids, when your kids see you as parents walk through what you've got to walk through, when they see you still go to church and you raise your hands, you still give your tithe checks, you worship God throughout your life, you're putting your victories into them. And your victories will outlive you. Amen? Somewhere down the road they say, I remember when mom and dad went through this. Here's how they did it. ka That's what you reading his Bible. I can remember my dad doing this. I can remember my dad praying over me when I was sick. All those things are your victories going into the next generation. Amen? Can I say this real quick? One of the greatest ways to stamp out racism, the long-term way to stamp out racism is to raise your kids without it. Amen? That's the long-term effect I wasn't raised with a racist family. It was not put into me and my generation, my sisters, and myself. It was non-existent. That's one of the ways you stamp out racism is raise the next generation without it. Okay? We need to move on? All right, let's go on to the next slide here. Okay? Now, we get a turning point. We're going to fast forward this and wrap this up. Okay? We've got David. He's got songs written about him. He's got victories that were attributed to him that he didn't do. But we get to a place in David's life, some 15, about 17 years later. He's now in his mid-30s. Okay? That's important. In, in 1 Samuel chapter 30, verses 1 through 8, David is out fighting the armies of Israel. And he comes back. His men come back uh, to find out that the Amalekites had come into Ziklag and stolen everything they've had. Okay? Now, isn't that a lot of fun? You're out doing the work of the Lord, and you come home and find everything gone. That's got to be a blow to the gut, right? Okay? Let's go on a little bit further. It says, one victory, David won recognition and ascribed his thousands of victories. Okay, let's move on now. And when David and his men came to the city, behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters had been taken captive. Okay? This is the condition they came back to. Next slide, please. Is there one more? And then David and the people who were with him lifted their voices and wept until there was no strength left in them. That's a serious cry. 
Okay? You're going to put on a cry face with that one. How many likes their cry face? <laughs> I get it. Okay? So these guys, these guys weep and weep and weep till there's nothing left in them. That's how tragic this is. All their families, wives, children, all gone. Now this is unparalleled in David's life. Up to this point, David had victories and victories and victories. And now while he's out doing God's work, this comes to his house and happens to his house. Next slide, please. Moreover, David was greatly distressed because the people spoke of stoning him, for all the people were embittered. Key point. Next slide. Each one because of the sons and the daughters, but David strengthened himself in the Lord. This is a key point. How many knows it's easier sometimes to strengthen others than it is to strengthen yourself? I can give you all kinds of words of encouragement. I can, hey, listen, I can give you the raw, raw speech, right? You can make it. You can do it. But when I'm alone by myself, can I strengthen myself? That's hard, isn't it? Okay, that's tough. I'm not saying it's not. But David knew enough to strengthen himself in the Lord. In other words, I've got to go back because he's the leader. I've got to begin to go back and strengthen myself back up because his men are wanting to kill him at this point. So not only have you lost everything, the guys you run with, your posse, your boys, are now talking about stoning you. It's a tough place, right? Let's go on. And David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue this band? Shall I overtake them? Interesting question. Why, would that, why did David word his question to God like that? Why didn't he just say, God, what am I supposed to do? It was not a generic question. It was very specific. Why? I think because David knew the answer. What does that tell me? How many times am I asking God about something that I already know the answer to? Yeah. 11 o'clock last night, I'm writing that out going, <clears throat> but God, we're supposed to ask about everything, right? And sometimes I'm asking God for stuff, I already know the answer. I don't know what the answer is. But I just want to make sure God has a chance to speak to me, right? When he already know what to do. I think David already knew what to do because he worded the question the way he did. Next slide, please. And God answered him and said, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake them, and you shall surely rescue all. David asked the leading question to God, and God gave him the leading answer back. I think there was a time in David's life he would have never have asked God that question. He would have just gone and done it. That's the type of man David was. He wouldn't even consider taking this before God. He would have strapped his sword on and said, Boys, we're going to go get what we got. We're going to get our stuff back. But there's a place of discouragement. We are not really sure what you're supposed to do next. But if you get quiet and you listen from God and hear that still small voice, He'll tell you what you already know to do. See, I don't have to ask whether I should forgive somebody or not. I already know to forgive, right? The Word already tells us to forgive. I already know these things that God's... But we want to get real super spiritual about it, right? Or maybe this is just for me. I want to get really super spiritual about it. And I want to get alone with God. And God, what about this, this, and this? And God said, you already know. Man, God just has a way of taking all of our excuses... Right? And just throw them in the trash can for us. Next slide. What's the cost of doing nothing? What does the future like, look like if nothing changes? It bothers me to see people cycle through the same things over and over and over again. It bothered me when I worked in corrections and we would see guys come in from the time they were 15 to the time they were 20 and they just cycled back and through over and over and over again. And my question was, didn't you learn anything the first time you were here? Yeah, but. And they're back. And it happens again and again and again. We had one young man come back to us five times in five years. And I'm thinking, guess what? If you don't stop the cycle, it's going to happen again. The point is, I hate to see people walk through the same things over and over and over again. I hate walking through the same thing over and over again. I hate tripping in the same spot every single time, right? 
if you trip, <laughs> we have uh, our bedroom, there's a, the footboard on our bedroom has left more bruises on my kneecap <laughs> than I can shake a stick at, doesn't it? It sticks out about this far, and at my height, it catches me bone on wood. And you think, when am I going to learn that that thing's there? Because that hurts. You drive your kneecap into that thing, it hurts. And, you, and pain should be a good teacher. But how many know sometimes it's not? People walk through the same pain over and over and over again. Same pain over and over again. I just want to see people break those cycles. Cycles of fear, depression, anxiety. No joy, no peace. Let's step back, evaluate what do we need to do different. What needs to be different this time around? Amen? Let's stand, please. <clears throat> do you need anything out of this this morning? So here's what I want to do. I just want to challenge you guys, and I've challenged myself. I do this continually. I write down the stuff. I write down my stuff, and I say, okay, this is where this gets real for me. When I'm confronted with this, 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 or this, those are the places. Where's my anxiety yet? Where's my fear at? What is it that's causing me to go into a place of depression? What is it the scenario or the person or whatever? It can be fear of past, fear of future, fear of change. I'm one of these that fear, has a fear of things not changing. That's just me. It, it bothers me to think things will always be the same way. I hate the status quo. That's just me. So whatever it is, whatever this bothering you, document it, write it down. Put it on paper and say, that's the puppy right there that's tripping me. And I don't want to trip in the same spot again. And let's be really smart about the tactics the enemy and people like to use to get into your, into your head. In other words, the enemy will live rent free right here. It's not costing him a thing to be inside our heads. No, that's got to go. That's got to go. In Jesus' name. Father, in Jesus' name, we just pray for those who would even be watching on, on live stream and in this room, Father, that there's a cost to doing nothing. There's a cost to letting the giant stay in our lives. And I want to go after that. I want to take the confidence in the Word of God. His Word says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do it. I can do it because you said you'd strengthen me. You made us more than conquerors. Greater are you that's in me than he that's in this world. So that warrior spirit that's dormant. Father, I pray, Holy Spirit, blow on that spirit. Raise it up. That if someone came against our family, you would see a side of us. So as the enemy comes and tries to take from us, Holy Spirit, rise up within us that we will not allow that thief to have that again. You're not taking my joy today. You're not taking my peace today. You can't have it. It's not yours, it's mine. And there's people who would fight for their property to the death. There's people who would fight for their child. But we'll bow down and let the enemy talk to us between our ears. No, you can't have it. That six inches of real estate doesn't belong to the enemy. I just get this picture of our, between our ears, this space right in between our ears is so valuable, it's so precious. It's a God-given thing. It's called our mind. It belongs to the devil. It belongs to the word, renewed Word of God. That's where peace comes from. So, Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for your Word. We thank you that you have given us the tools and the equipment to go after these giants. They may seem insurmountable at times. They may be talking to us at times. 
But David was so confident in who he was and who you were. He knew he didn't have to back down. He didn't have to back away. (laughs) He knew he could step out and conquer. So Holy Spirit, I ask that you seal this word in the hearts of us this morning, that you would just ignite it inside of us, and that we can be a warrior just like David. In Jesus' name, amen. If anybody needs ministry to this morning, if you need ministering to, would you come on up? We'll pray with you. If not, uh, God love you. God bless you. We love you guys. We love you back, Brother Greg.